So welcome to our webinar from the Integrating Intelligence webinar series. Today we're going to talk about integrating intelligence and, think, and we're going to talk about it from the perspective of the intelligence enterprise. So thank you for joining us. This will be about an hour long presentation. We'll leave a little bit of time at the end for questions. And we're going to go through a lot of the challenges that we're facing today and how an integrated intelligence enterprise helps us solve those challenges and what are some of the details of what it takes to have an integrated enterprise. I think, you know, you really just don't have to do anything but just turn on the news today and you'll see that there's really a lot of challenges that our national intelligence community faces today and they're more complex than ever before. The issues don't necessarily lie with just nation states and they don't necessarily involve a traditional military force. So everything we do from our systems and our workflows needs to be dynamic, adept, and able to deal with emerging challenges in the global environment. The volume of data is growing exponentially every day and critical decisions need to be fast to ensure mission success. We're also seeing many new advances in technology, whole new patterns emerging. There's new sources of data that are needed to help understand a complex threat environment. We also have many new technology developments. There's an explosion of new sources of information, drones, consumer devices, social media and real-time reporting. So this new data creates demand for new applications. The app revolution provides people access to information with the ability to analyze it and visualize it like never before. So all of these advances ride on technology trends with great increases in computing power and storage. Similar to many technology trends, every user wants a personalized view or interaction with their data, like you may see in your common social media applications. The fact is, as an intelligence enterprise, we can now create a data environment for managing and storing vast new collections of data and make it available to anyone in the organization on any device at any time in a manner that is meaningful for them. We're seeing in this trend that location mapping and GIS are becoming essential. GIS is a fundamental language for understanding and managing our world. It provides us content and context about everything. All activity happens at a time and a place, and space and time is how we can understand all intelligence activity. Here at Esri, we like to think about this as the science of where. This is the field we study, which is the science of geography and the applications of GIS technology. And it's a language about understanding, managing information, both inside organizations and between and among organizations. In the science where we like to think about it as a framework and process for managing and understanding the world. And in intelligence, we can really think about the same exact concept applied in our world. We need to be able to collect information and do data management and integration. We need to be able to visual, we primarily do that so we can visualize the data. We can see the information and understand it in context of where and when it's happening. We do analysis and modeling on the data to do predictions and to look at forecasts of the future but also to identify patterns and trends and activities. We collaboratively support planning and design. Our intelligence feeds into planning processes and helps us understand the effects of our operations and activities. It helps decision makers, whether that's the policy makers or the actual strategic decision makers executing military plans and operations. And finally, of course, that translates into action and we measure those actions and kind of feed through the loop again. So this dynamic process is really informed by and managed by a GIS system. In this new pattern, we're seeing GIS is connecting everyone. We're seeing in organizations that are modern, especially in modern intelligence organizations, everybody wants to see their data and information on a map. It used to be that this was just the realm of you know, specialists or, or GIS professionals, but these days, every single system, every single intelligence component People want to be able to access and view information on a map and then you be able to access authoritative data and combine it with their analysis and individual products. They want to do that in anywhere at any time as more tablets and more mobile devices are becoming a reality. And of course, people's desktop environments. They want to be able to analyze data and work with it in their own environment, in their own space and have their own power to make maps as part of their intelligence workflows. A GIS embeds analytics and visualization. So it's not just about looking at data on a map. It's also about analyzing data in order to gain insights. So having a system for gaining insights, whether that's big data analytics or interactive exploration and interaction with data, or it might be robust modeling in the form of spatial analytics and geoprocessing. And what we're seeing is that GISs are becoming distributed. So in the past, I think the trend in terms of an enterprise GIS system was to centralize all the GIS capabilities but the power of the cloud and even our classified clouds in our, in our workspaces and even just more advanced computing means that we can actually distribute the GIS capabilities. So we can have GIS capabilities where they're needed close to the data, close to the users, so that they, they can do the work that they need to do in their environment 
and then they can share and collaborate through systems of systems. And this is enabled by portal technologies and that enable collaboration in a distributed fashion across the intelligence enterprise. And so GIS is really that fundamental platform. And what we've seen is it's a platform for implementing these different systems. So what you'll see is that in many environments and the ways that you're interacting with the GIS inside of an enterprise is you'll, you'll interact with different kinds of systems in your intelligence enterprise. So the most common kind of system in an intelligence enterprise today is what we call that system of record. This is the system for managing um, the authoritative content. So for example, your foundational geoeng information where the data is transactionally managed and updated, it's very centralized control, and there's a, usually a process of production and dissemination of separate activities. But we also see then people now interacting with the GIS in the system of engagement. So being able to take their own shoebox of intelligence data, upload that data into a system, make their own maps, and share it with their, with their group of people without this high level restrictive process. This is more about collaboration and sharing and interacting with each other to do analysis and, and, and share information. And then finally, of course, the real drive in the community is to move beyond just visualizing data and actually get doing predictive analytics in order to gain insights about the future. In order to do that, we need a system of insights. We need a system for managing our data, but also for providing access to rich analytic tools capable of analyzing big data, bringing together our enterprise content, being used to drive these insightful analytics. So as I mentioned, you're gonna encounter those different systems. And in many cases, these, some of these systems exist um, in your organizations and maybe they're either stovepiped or they're becoming integrated together. So in the system of records, we have things like our foundational data, but we might also have our authoritative image libraries. Um, this is where we're managing that authoritative content and we're doing transactional workflows. In that system of engagement, it's very consumer focused. So we like to think about every analyst having access to mapping on their on their, in the browser and on their desktop, helps them unlock their data and also helps them get access to services through their community. The data has to be easy to discover in this case, it has to be self-service, and it has to be able to be done on any device, and it has to be lightweight. And then finally, in the system of insights, these are really emerging patterns. We've definitely, of course, in the intelligence community, be doing, been doing analytics for a long time, but an enterprise system for enabling analytics in order to gain insights has some specific characteristics. It lets us do things like event-based alerting. We can do pattern detection and analysis. We can do predictive analytics, but we can also let people in our organization do their own analytics themselves, again, through their browser and not having to have necessarily high-end tools on every single computer in our organization. And of course, the, the system of insights really supports a rapid decision-making where we're not just taking data, but we're taking data, combining it with analysis in order to help drive decision-making. And we talked to organizations about what does it take to actually evolve to having a true enterprise GIS in our intelligence enterprise we tend to recommend looking at four specific areas. There's many things you can do, but there tends to be four common patterns. So one of them is this need to integrate imagery into the work in analytic workflow. Imagery is still one of the best sources of data for real time or up-to-date information. And quite often it's locked away in you know, specialized systems for storage and retrieval and access, and it's not available to everybody in the organization. But imagery provides that context than other intelligence information can relate to. So it needs to be integrated into these analytic workflows and provided to everybody in the organization. You also wanna take that analytic content, the data that's quite often analyst analysis in progress and share that with the enterprise through the system of engagement. This helps you derive deeper insights. So connect to your big data systems, connect to your um, larger systems in order to drive deeper insights and give analysts access to that data and tools. And then finally do that through mission focused apps. The, the days of big monolithic apps is gone and we're moving towards these mission focused apps where people need access to focused apps that they can do their analysis, but they can also share their analysis with others and share their products with others through very focused applications that don't require um, large amounts of training to implement. So this is something you need to do as a continuous evolution in order to align with some of the technology advancements. So what we're gonna be going into now is we're gonna look at some of the technology specifically that enables this enterprise and how that works together. And to start with, we're gonna actually take a look at the kind of key technology that is the integrating capability, which is the ArcGIS portal, which enables our WebGIS pattern. And I'm gonna turn it over to Craig Cleveland, who's gonna show us um, a quick tour of the portal. Thanks, Ben. 
So what I'd like to do is, is walk through the, the portal, as, as Ben just mentioned. And to me, the, the portal is really the heartbeat of the ArcGIS platform. This is where those various systems that, that Ben just spoke to you about, they, they come together and it makes a, a perfect place for, for sharing um, and collaborating and discovery of content. So what we're looking at now is the homepage of, of my portal here. And what we can see is a, a number of pieces of curated content across the front. And these are both finished Intel products as well as data sources and other things of that nature that portal administrators have, have felt are key for people to gain quick and easy access to. Similarly, as we move to uh, the gallery of the portal, this is a place where we can find larger pieces of curated content uh, that have been brought together. These have been organized thematically, again, to help for quick discovery for users to gain access to and use in, in their workflow. Uh, you also have the ability to uh, and to select those items which are key for you as individuals and label those as favorites. So again, you can get uh, easy access uh, to them and, and utilize them in the workflows and the things that you do on a daily basis. But one of the, the places that we see users spend uh, a great deal of their time is in the mapping component uh, of the portal. This is where we can build what we call web maps, which become the foundation for many of the things that you'll see throughout today's uh, demonstrations. So here in the map viewer, uh, we have the ability to reach out to various base maps that, that may be appropriate for the different types of works that, that we're doing. So something like a light gray canvas base map, if we wanted to really highlight our operational data or if we needed imagery based map. And all of these are of course dynamic and interactive uh, and allow us to move across scale quickly and, and, and easily. So what I'd like to do for you is uh, just quickly build out a web map and, and show you uh, uh, how one of these web maps comes together and then some of the ways in which you can share this out with the users that, that you support. So the way that we can bring content to the map is, is uh, uh, has a lot of different variety. Um, we can do this in many ways. Uh, I'm going to utilize the, the Add Data button here and first show you how I can just bring some content that I have locally here on my machine. And I'm going to choose to add a layer from file. And in my case, I'm going to add up a zipped up shape file here. And the data we're going to explore uh, is around Libya and some of the areas of control uh, as you know, Libya has been in the news a lot over the uh, recent years and uh, things have changed there and different areas of the country are under different control. Um, so I just want to interrogate that data to try to understand that situation a little bit. And simply by adding that shape file to my map, I can immediately see uh, the different control areas across the country. And that was done uh, by the portal uh, utilizing our smart mapping technology and it's interrogated the data and presented it to me in a meaningful manner. And of course, I could always change that if I wanted, um, but I like that default, so I'll go ahead and keep that. And we can do things like rename our layers and other uh, tasks uh, of that nature. I wanna continue to layer in co content here, but this isn't just about the content that I bring to the portal, right? It's about collaborating with others and discovering content. And so I have the ability to, to search uh, across the enterprise and I can just scroll through layers of information and, and find those things if I want. Uh, as we consider the uh, uh, Libya and the situation there, you know, one of the things that is uh, on the forefront is of course the natural resources they have. So there's a layer here uh, of pipelines that shows the different gas and oil pipelines as they, they move across the country. And now I can just quickly in an overlay analysis visually see you know, where those uh, resources are and what territories um, they move through. Now again, as we continue to kind of dig deeper into this, one of the things I'd like to bring to the table is you know, maybe certain uh, civic unrest, different uh, event types that have happened. And I don't know where that may be, so I'm just gonna do a, a search for events. And what I can see here is a colleague has actually uh, uploaded some uh, Jane's, IHS Jane's data uh, for me to gain access to, and I can add that to my map. So here in just a matter of a, a few seconds, I've been able to bring some local file-based data, uh, other service-enabled data that's been shared across my organization, um, and I can see where these areas of controls are, where key infrastructure is, and then different events of civic uh, unrest that have occurred and of course, all of these are dynamic and interactive 
and I can dig into the details of these items to find out more about them. This comes together in something that we call a web map, which of course we can save into our shoebox and we can give this a title and tags to help make it discoverable. And then of course provide a summary of this and save this. I now have the ability to share this out across my organization and with other uh, uh, folks that I collaborate with through a very simple sharing mechanism. And so here are my options to share with uh, everyone who may be able to access my portal, just the portal itself, or different groups uh, that I collaborate around, whether those are project-based or, or area of interest-based. And then ultimately that sharing, uh, we can also do in a number of these mission-focused apps, which I'm gonna talk to you about here in just a, just a few minutes. So that's a very brief introduction into some of the key capabilities uh, of the portal. Uh, again, that is really, I like to describe as the heartbeat of the ArcGIS platform that brings together that foundational content, that user content, and where we begin to, to paint a picture of understanding and analysis. Thanks a lot, Craig. Um, like I said, that was, a quick, that was a quick overview. And I think the, the key thing to point out as we go through the rest of the session is, you're not going to necessarily see that same interface that, that Craig showed you of the portal, but you're actually going to keep seeing the portal information show up in many different applications and many different parts of the system. So he's kind of showed you the, 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 the interface that gets to the portal, but everything behind it is part of this information system in this enterprise and it's accessible through a variety of applications. So now we're going to move on to is we're going to talk about these different systems. And when we're talking about an enterprise um, capability, we, we like to think about each of the systems and what are the, some of the considerations in implementing those individual systems. So to start with, um, you know, we, I like to remind us, you know, why are we, why are we even talking about GIS in an enterprise? And I think the key thing for me, and we talk about intelligence, is we we want to connect our intelligence and our operations as much as we can together. So thinking about it in the sense of connecting everybody from the analytics side, so our analysts, whether that's human analysts or geospatial analysts. Um, being able to use maps and information to do their analysis, but ultimately your your purpose in doing that is to reach you know, decision makers, policy makers, or even ultimately, you know, the war fighters themselves. And to do that, you know, it's, you really need a system that's comprehensive and capable. So on the top of that system is what we think of as that system of engagement, the system that everybody's using to access and create these maps. But underneath it, the thing that basically makes this work, the fuel that fuels this, this vehicle, is what we would say are these foundational capabilities. So foundational data. And this data in the intelligence world can take on many different forms. And so I think of them as, you know, the world, the, the data that we build in-house, so the authoritative foundational content that's built by many of the agencies that hopefully some of you guys work for, um, like NGA, DIA, others, they create foundational intelligence data as a major part of the, what they do. In addition to that, we have data that comes in from the outside. And this is where we're seeing a lot of growth in data is the open source intelligence information. So data that's available on the internet is the way to make, make that clear. There's lots and lots of data now being produced and shared that's geographic in nature as open source and all that data can be used and fused together into a system and made available to everybody in the organization and that 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 system is 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 a key concept part of that system in addition to our traditional kind of foundational mapping data might be the feeds of information so data is being collected by national sources or or sources in theater or even a reporting coming in from the field um, in terms of formats and messaging that data can be also thought of as a system of record of real time information or information feeds that are coming in and then being used by analysts and fused together to make multi-int products. And so part of that workflow is, is the creation of foundational geospatial intelligence. And that's really done in what we'd say is this traditional production process. So it's the idea of having people, you know, looking at imagery, making observations, capturing reporting data and putting it in, in a structured format as structured observations and then being shared with everybody else in the organization. And this is often done through very, rigorous production processes and there's tools for managing and collecting this information, workflows from, for producing content, and then creating these kind of dissemination databases where everybody's accessing that data. And some of that data might be in the form of cached base maps. Um, some of that data is in the form of raw dynamic data services and also data that can be extracted and downloaded so it can be actually used in the field when disconnected from the environment. And so that system of record is used today in many different environments to produce you know, foundational data like our aero and our topo maps. It's used to produce the authoritative base maps that are used 
um, in these communities and the projections that are used and, and recognized by um, everybody in the community. And that authoritative content is built to a specification. It's loaded in from data coming from um, other parts of our organization or even maybe contractors producing data and bringing it in. And then it's made available through a variety of applications through that same portal um, interface that we're talking about. So one part of that, though, is we think about this idea of foundation GON. I think we like to think of it in the form of what we call a living atlas. So it's, it used to be that the foundation data was always essentially old, right? It was always out of date because it was in the form of paper maps, right? You'd print the maps out, you'd send it out, and they would be always out of date by the time that they were printed and by the time they were sent out. But now we're thinking of it more as this living set of data where as data is updated and data is produced or collected, it's being made available as living services that people can integrate directly into their applications. They're not having to take the data, convert it, upload it into their own systems. They can just integrate it directly in their applications. And this data takes on many different forms across many different themes. It is that authoritative base maps, which is of course what we all expect, but it's things like human geography data, demographic data, boundary data, name data, imagery data, elevation data, and kind of the list goes on. As, as you think about this living atlas, this, this should be a constantly growing collection of data that we then can use for our analysis um, and visualization, and we can integrate into our analytic workflows. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Craig, and he's gonna just kind of show you examples of this concept of a living atlas and how we see that um, coming to life in organizations. Thanks, Ben. So as Ben noted, uh, he thinks about this in the context of a li living atlas. So I'd like to show you uh, the living atlas that, that we provide um, and some of the content that's available uh, within there. So as we scroll here, you know, we can immediately get into uh, different forms of authoritative content. This is both Esri curated content and user curated content. Uh, as Ben noted, we often think about this initially in the form of base maps. So if I select that category, you can see that rich set of base maps that come with the ArcGIS platform, uh, both in the form of, of, of raster base maps and, and as, as well as vector tile base maps. And that's really that foundational sort of element to which we uh, begin to overlay all our operational data on. However, uh, there is much more to it than just the base map and those things that are slightly more static. There's real-time data, say in the form of weather. So if I do a search here for weather, I can see all that rich content that's that's made available here, uh, much of which is, is of course, uh, real-time or near real-time. And so let's take a look at this current wind and weather conditions and open that up in the uh, map viewer uh, of our portal here. And so this layer is, is showing us global wind and weather conditions, and it is a near real-time layer. So as I can zoom over to our area of interest here, we can, of course, interact with this layer and find out the details uh, and understand, you know, the date and time that this reading was last taken, what our wind direction is, uh, the speed of it, temperatures, and, you know, visibility, and, and much more. So that near real-time weather can be uh, extremely important for us as we're uh, planning um, and just having daily understanding and situational awareness. Now, if we're thinking about our, our work today and our demonstrations in the context of around Libya, and we want to understand the, the people and places uh, that, that are there, so we can look into, say, some of our landscape data and try to uh, do a search here for land cover and say, what is what is the land cover in Libya look like? And if we do a search here, we'll see that we have a, a world land cover layer, uh, again, that we can open in our base map, or excuse me, open in our, our portal here. And I'll quickly just adjust the transparency so we can see our base map uh, beneath it and get us zoomed over to, to Libya again. And if we look at the legend for this uh, land cover data, we, we can quickly get a visual as to, as to what that geography looks like. We can see that it's uh, a very barren landscape with, with minimal uh, vege vegetation. So the first thing that comes to my mind is trying to understand, okay, if that's our landscape, you know, where, where are people living uh, within this landscape? And so I wanna access some city content. But what's great about the Living Atlas is that I don't always have to go back to the app itself. It's integrated within the ArcGIS platform. And much like before, when I did a search for some layers or added some layers locally, I can actually browse my Living Atlas layers here and do a search for world cities. If I do that search, I can then immediately add that layer to my map. There we 
we go. And uh, that layer will then help me to understand, you know, where those cities are across uh, the country. And of course, much like uh, the other layers, they're interactive and I can click on them, find out details, city names, uh, understand the uh, population sizes, whether things are, are, are capitals and, and so on and so forth. So this helps to immediately quickly uh, paint a picture of what the landscape looks like and, and where people are throughout the country. But I want some more details uh, about that. And again, this is where the Living Atlas uh, is ex extremely powerful is we can come back to it and we can change our search criteria here to uh, focus on demographics. And I'm going to do a search for World Bank, which provides some some very rich uh, uh, demographic data across the globe. And what I'd like to point out here is so far we've looked at individual layers within our, our Living Atlas, but Living Atlas brings much more than that. It brings finished applications as well as finished maps. And in this case, we're going to look at an existing uh, web map and we will open that right up. And this particular layer actually is time enabled. We can see this. So it has uh, content uh, throughout time here. So I'm going to move that uh, up to um, 2007 here. And if we look at the actual uh, layers that are within this map, you'll see there's really a wealth of data here. So we can see things uh, such as life expectancies, um, and we can look at that for both males uh, as well as females and get context as to, you know, what does that look like in terms of the other geographies that are, are in and around that area. So really brings uh, a wealth of both foundational uh, and real-time uh, content to us in, in one integrated place that helps us as analysts begin to understand the geography that we're working in and be able to present that back out to our users. All right, yeah, thanks, thanks for that, Craig. So the, as, as Craig was showing, you know, that's that's our our um, implementation at Esri, the Living Atlas. Everybody who has access to ArcGIS has access to the Living Atlas. Um, in many of the environments that organizations work in where you're in classified environments, many of these same capabilities exist in terms of access to authoritative base maps, as well as access to con authoritative content in the form of these kind of living services. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna move on to this then system of engagement. So for, for me, the system of record, I think that's existed for a long time. It's very important to build these foundational capabilities up, but ultimately the reason for having a system of record is so you can engage and provide access to data to everybody in your organization. I think one of the things I want to mention here is really when you think about then providing access to data, it's actually for a couple purposes. And this is really simple. But, you know, when you think about GIS data, there's definitely is the desire to overlay data. So I want to put my data on top of a map and I want to integrate it with other data just visually. And that's really important and actually very useful in and of itself. But the other way that you want to integrate the data um, is to actually integrate it in your analytics and modeling. So modeling across different data sets. And this is why it's so crucial that this data is made available as data services, and that it's made available in a way that it can actually be integrated both visually, but also analytically. Um, and, it needs, and people in the organization need to be able to use the data in both ways. So when you think about ArcGIS and how it fits into that, you know, its purpose is really managing all aspects of ArcGIS. So the spatial infrastructure for our organization. So that's can be in the form of apps, um, data and services, uh, maps and charts that we've created, but it's also integrating people. So we have now the idea that people log into the system. They work in organizing groups, and you saw some of this in some of the portal examples already. And they access information um, that's organized for a purpose for them to use um, for their analysis. And portal is the thing that's providing that. And that's enabling that system engagement we talked about earlier. So everybody in the organization, and this is an expectation I'd say that is that just exists today, and you know, modern worker, modern workforces, everybody in the organization wants to be able to make maps, upload data, and create their own products in their own way, integrate that data in their own ways and beyond maybe what the authoritative system of record producer thought of. So we actually have, a, um, I'd say, a system that really well represents um, the system of engagement that's in, in use today. Um, and that's what we call, we refer to the, refer to the ICGIS portal. So NGA is, is the provider of this for the intelligence community in the US. Um, it rides on the, I, the iSight, the intelligence community IT enterprise. So it runs in the cloud and inside the IC. And it actually has more than 60,000 users across this. And that's where I say this is a, it's an example of a successful system of engagement. 
this goes beyond the traditional professional GIS analysts, and this is about extending mapping data, information, and applications to everybody um, in the intelligence community. And this has become a, a proof that this is a system that's desired, but also can be easily implemented and can be successful um, for intelligence community. And the way that we do that, the way we see that coming to life is through what we often call as mission-focused apps. So these applications that support, you know, the intelligence cycle from collecting data to doing exploitation analysis and producing and disseminating intelligence products. And there's a wide variety of these applications. And for some people who think traditionally about large scale monolithic apps, this might be a little intimidating, the idea of numerous apps. But this actually works really well from a user perspective. You only use the app you need the app you need has a very small set of focus functionality. It doesn't require a lot of training. It doesn't require you learning where data is and how data is being used. Um, you can just open the app, use it, and then kind of move on um, with the rest of your day. So there's actually a large number of these apps um, in use, and, they're, and more and more of them are being created every day. And they're being created in a sustainable manner by using configurable applications to create these, these, these mission-focused apps. So now I'm going to turn it back to Craig again, and he's going to actually show you kind of what, it, what does it take? What is a mission-focused app, and what does it take to make um, one of these mission-focused applications? Fantastic. Thanks, Ben. Uh, so, yeah, I, I just want to show you some of these mission-focused apps and, and how they come together. Um, I think one of the key things I always like to relay to users is how quickly and easily that these apps can come together uh, as well. So these things I'm about to show you are all applications uh, that are configurable. Um, we don't need to be web developers to create them. We don't have to be, uh, don't have to have access to web servers. And we're able to really create these powerful applications that, that help relay um, key, key ideas, uh, key knowledge to, to our constituents. So the first thing I want to show you here is a, a form of a story map that's called a map journal. Uh, this is one that uh, a colleague of mine put together around showing different intel sources coming together to, to look at Libya and understand the situation uh, there. And so this particular application uh, moves together very much in a briefing type of context, um, and it, it will... Um, show interactive uh, maps here. So this, you'll recall, is the areas of control content. And on the left-hand side, we see a narrative here that talks about this. So, you know, how did this happen? When did this uh, 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 occur? And what do these different uh, areas represent? And, and who are the folks that are, are in control of them? We continue to move through this. It's it's much like a, a briefing uh, or a story, and and hence the name story map there. Um, and it and it talks to us about you know these various factions and and things that are happening here, and talks about this conflict uh, that occur because of that. And so we can enable this conflict data, and we can continue to move through this brief. And if we were to read through this line by line, we'd understand the, the, the situation there and what's going on and understand that in both space and time, as, as Ben mentioned. So these story maps become very key tools to help brief in a dynamic and interactive uh, context. Now, that's one example of a mission-focused app that was created from the portal, which you saw in my initial demonstration. Another type of app is something that we call the Operations Dashboard. This app happens to be a desktop app, and it also utilizes a, a web map. And in this case, it's, it's great for consuming both you know, real-time content and presenting uh, an overall uh, common operating picture or, or high-level situational awareness. And in this example, what we're looking at is uh, looking at it from the perspective of a SIGINT analyst who's monitoring events all across the country in, in near real time and needs to be able to quickly consume and digest this large quantity of content and be able to make heads or tails of it. So what we can see here on our map are five different areas of interest that we're uh, keeping an eye on. And what's happening over on the left-hand side is the most recent events are continuing to, to stream in here in a list for us. And immediately we're able to understand what type of event it is, what its classification is, and the date and time that that event uh, has occurred. Uh, similarly, we, we have a number of widgets here that are configured to, to um, uh, categorize this data, help us to understand the quantity of event types or classifications that have come in, and other provide other real-time uh, metrics for us. 
So we have this quick glance at all this uh, qu large quantity of data that's come in, and we're able to make heads or tails of that uh, very quickly and easily through this desktop-driven uh, app called the Operations Dashboard. Another app is something that's uh, called the Web App Builder, and the Web App Builder really allows us to make tailored apps uh, that are focused on a particular user or a use case um, in a configurable sense. And in this case, this particular web app was built to help support some structured observation uh, management. So looking at uh, the Tripoli airport, there was an attack on the airport in July of 2014. Um, as a part of that, there was, a, of course, a great deal of damage that was done, and we want to be able to capture that damage and, and, and catalog that. So what we, we see here with this, within this particular application is, you know, the traditional layer list. So if I want to toggle on the, the points of uh, detail that we'll be able to capture, we can do that. Uh, we have a, a bookmark capability here, so that allows us to zoom into particular areas of interest uh, that we'll need to capture these observations quickly and easily. Um, and we also have a, a swipe capability. So if I want to be able to swipe between pre and post event imagery here, we can easily do that to see the damage uh, that has occurred. But again, the main focus of this particular app uh, is, is not just in to, to look, but to capture observations. So I want to go ahead and just look at my post event imagery and we'll use this editing capability to capture information on damaged uh, airplanes that have happened here. So we can simply uh, click on the map where those are and we could capture any attributes that, that we wanted to uh, related to these features. Um, but for demonstration purposes, just kind of moving quickly here, showing you how those things uh, come together. And so all those observations could then be captured and then uh, utilized in other places uh, within the enterprise, whether to use in analysis or to use in briefing uh, capabilities. So the question I always get, though, is uh, how does this come together? How do we how do we build an app like that? Um, you know, how do we how do we create that? And I'll show you how quick and easy this can be. So we're full circle now back at our portal uh, where we have created another web map, much like you saw me create on the fly earlier. Um, and in this case, I brought in the same key layers uh, of interest here. Uh, the way we get this web map into an app is through our sharing context. And we will choose, in this case, the, the web app builder. And we're going to go ahead and launch this. And the way this works is we just have a, a handful of configuration options that we can choose to, to meet our needs. So there are themes that control the user interface here. So as I toggle through a couple of these, you'll see these update in real time. And that's great in that we get immediate feedback uh, around uh, uh, the changes that we make. So this is the tab theme that we chose to use in the example that I just showed you. And then we choose uh, the widgets. And basically, the widgets are the capability that we're going to provide to the end user. So we get a couple by default here in the legend and the layer list. But I want to add both my bookmarks uh, to this. So we will add that. And we'll be presented with those bookmarks that are inherited from our web map. That'll allow for easy navigation for the user. And then, of course, because the key thing here is the editing, I want to be able to enable our, our editing widget. And then we could toggle on and off any layers that we wanted to allow the users to edit. So I want them to be able to edit all those, and I'll say OK. And finally, if I wanted uh, the users to be able to swipe between that pre and post event imagery, I could enable my swipe widget here. And then choose, you know, how do I want that swipe to occur, a vertical or horizontal bar or spyglass? I'll take the default, and I'm going to say, hey, let's uh, swipe away that pre event imagery. And I say OK. And I'll save this. And we'll just immediately go ahead and launch the application. And what you'll see here is essentially the same exact app that we were looking at a moment ago. I've now quickly created there in just a minute or two. And so that's how these mission focused apps uh, that meet these key and specific needs of the organization come together from that ArcGIS Enterprise right there at the portal, right at the heartbeat and then we can deliver these capabilities out to our users.
All right, yeah, great. Um, thanks, thanks, Craig. So I think that was, that was perfect. We saw a few different apps um, being used, and of course you saw what it took to create it. And I mean, really, Craig, actually, that's literally what it takes to create it. Already built it from scratch in front of us. And this is why, this is why environments like the ICGIS portal are getting to those large number of users is because they're coming in and using those simple focused apps. The experts in the organization are creating those apps, and then they're being shared, um, you know, with other people using these user-defined workflows. So this is a great place for if you're a GIS expert who's listening to this, this isn't making your job go away. If anything, it's making you more useful. You can do more than create static products. You can actually create these interactive apps for your users and give them some rich capabilities of their own. So with that, we're going to move on to kind of the last type of system, which is our system of insights. You know, we talked about this a little bit before is the system of insights is really about giving people the ability to perform rich and deep analytics on this data working with our geographic information, linking it together based on space and time, doing it against big data, kind of batch analytics, doing it interactively um, in simple applications, and then of course doing what we call that kind of rich spatial analysis and processing that probably most of you existing GIS users already do today. And all of these new ways of gaining insights and analytics are fitting into these, this new pattern of access. So we're going to start off with um, looking at a couple different types of analytic apps. One of the main apps we're going to look at is a new application called Insights for ArcGIS, which is really basically like a lot of people like to call it spatial BI. It's, it's the, like our business intelligence tools, but it's all around using spatial inside of that kind of environment. Drag and drop of our data, visualize, analyze quickly and iteratively, um, explore data and get answers back. Um, and actually, the easiest way to explain it is actually just to turn it back to Craig again, who's going to just show us um, the Insights application, along with some other tools uh, that analysts can now use to do this, these in, to gain insights from their data in this web GIS and enterprise environment. Thanks, Ben. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So let's look right at it. I, I agree that's the easiest way to do this. So Insights is an, an app that, that comes uh, with Portal. So we saw the Portal homepage here a moment ago, and actually it's just launched from the, the little app launcher here. And, and it's another app that's available to us within our organization. Uh, the paradigm here is we, we do our analysis on something called workbooks. And so we'll launch a, uh, a new workbook here. And then we're going to reach out to our uh, our portal and gain access to a bit of foundational content to to help us uh, uh, in that analysis. First thing I want to do is just uh, do a quick search here for for Libya. You'll see some of the same content you you saw earlier, and I want to go ahead and grab that control map, and that then is added onto a what we call a card here within our workbook. And that'll help us to set some context here. So I'm going to add a few data sources before we uh, really dive in. And the next thing I want to do is, is uh, search for something, um, uh, a data source called the Global Terrorism Database. And we're going to go ahead and look at that. And you'll see that has a global um, distribution. But I really want to focus that on Libya. So I need to start to use some of our uh, uh, spatial analysis components to, to narrow that content down. So I'm going to add one more piece of data here, and in this case, we're going to add some world boundaries, uh, specifically just some world administrative boundaries. And I don't need all of them. I, I just really want to focus on Libya. So there's some great tools here within Insights. You'll see uh, this app is, is great for kind of exploratory analysis and uh, easily able to, to make changes here to our content uh, on the fly. So I want to change that to just focus um, on Libya here, and we'll set that that filter to uh, uh, to narrow us down to to just Libya. And then once that filter completes, we're then going to go ahead and uh, rename this. I always like to do that so we know exactly what we have here. And then I'm going to add that uh, to my map. And for the moment, I'm just going to add it uh, as a layer. And of course, all these maps are, are dynamic and interactive, and you can see the layer that we've we've just added here. And we can do all sorts of um, 
you know, the, the normal things we can do within any of our GIS. We have the ability to style this and, and make changes to its colors and transparencies and so on and so forth. Uh, but of course, that is, that is not the, uh, the power of insights. The power is being able to ask questions of our data here dynamically and on the fly. So as I noted, the global terrorism data set is, uh, is, is global in nature, but I'm just interested in, in Libya here. So I would like to ask a little question here and say, hey, let's, let's run a spatial filter on this. And um, we're going to filter the global terrorism by our Libya boundaries. And now uh, you can see I have just uh, filtered that data just to uh, Libya. And it's actually created another data set over here. And we'll rename that to Global Terrorism Data Libya. And so I can get very uh, quickly and easily dynamic, uh, interactive with that. Um, we can even drag and drop this data again if we wanted and do a, a spatial aggregation. So if I wanted to look at just maybe counts of that data, uh, I can easily do that. And we'll run this again, and we'll see a second layer that, that uh, shows up here in my map. And these large points are now just showing us the counts based off of those geographies. So some of that very uh, traditional GIS analysis is, is there and, and possible. Um, but I think one of the, the, the greatest attributes of Insights is being able to get into the graphing and charting capabilities. So as I expose the various um, layers here, we can see all the attributes uh, about them. And if, if I'm interested in interrogating this more, it's, it's very simple. I can select a field, like the group name here that's associated with these terrorism events, and I can choose a chart type uh, to create. So I want to create a tree map here, which will show us uh, quickly all the uh, various groups. And you can see we have a large unknown uh, uh, quantity here. So I'm going to filter that out. And we'll do a quick search for that, and we'll filter that out. And our data will automatically update uh, here on the fly. And so now I can see the various group names that are associated with these terrorist events across Libya. So taking a global terrorism data set, filtered it to Libya, and now looking at just those groups that operate within those boundaries. And all of these graphs and charts are actually uh, completely interactive with the map. So as I uh, select um, a particular group on the map, the events that are associated with those group are then highlighted, okay? And so that is uh, just a, a great way to do some kind of exploratory analysis. What I like to do though is, is add a, uh, a couple of additional graphs here, some of the new graphs that have been uh, recently released and show you how we're not limited to just exploring one particular attribute of our data. We can actually explore uh, multiple attributes at, at one time. So I'm interested in the attack types uh, that are occurring and the, the time uh, that the attack types are occurring. I just want to see if there's any correlation uh, between these, if I can gain any insight or, or, or intelligence by looking at these two attributes at one time. I'm able to literally just drag and drop those here onto my page. And I can interactively change my visualization type here. And I want to uh, uh, choose something called a data clock here. Um, which will show me the breakdowns across uh, the months and then the particular attack type. And much like before, I want to go ahead and uh, filter out um, the unknowns so I can look at just those known quantities uh, for the time being. So here, if we expand this a little bit, we can easily see over the course of the year the different attack types and then you know see when there are uh, uh, hot and, and cold times for those different attack types across the calendar year. Finally, I'd like to add one more, um, uh, a, a new uh, graph type. And this is called a chord diagram. So I want to see if there's a correlation between the, the groups that are, are um, acting and the geographies in which they're acting. So I'm going to grab the provincial states and the group name and create a chart here. And in, in this uh, instance, I'm going to grab a chord diagram. And much like before, before we interrogate this a little bit more, uh, we're going to go ahead and filter out our unknown groups. And what makes this particular graph so very powerful is what we now see are correlations between a geography and a group. So in this case, if I select um, the the Ansar al-Sharia group, 
I can see that the vast majority of the uh, terrorism events associated with them all happen in Benghazi. Or I can select uh, the, the, the Tripoli province here of the Islamic State and see that the vast majority of those events happen in Sirte. So now you just have this ability to get into this exploratory analysis to, to gain intelligence within your data. And as you do that uh, through these graphs and charts, again, they're all interactive and dynamic. And you can see as I click on one element over here and my other cards and maps on the sides, they highlight. Now the beauty is all this work as I'm doing it is actually getting saved uh, in an analysis view. So all of this has been tracked and we can utilize this again. So if we come up with a, um, a particular workflow, a particular tradecraft that we find is, is extremely helpful in analyzing a situation, we can then utilize this analysis again against another data set. And uh, of course, you know, the, the power here is sharing this out with other analysts and we have the ability here to share our pages uh, with folks here. We could uh, give this a name and share this out with others uh, in, in the form of our finished analysis there so they could look at and interrogate uh, that piece as well. All right, so thank, thanks for that, Craig. So actually, we're going to go ahead and move into um, just kind of wrapping up um, some of the discussion. As a note, I want to make, we have a few minutes left. If you have questions you want to ask, um, please start to enter those now into the questions box so we can get those right here as we're as we finish up um, the discussion. So you know basically what we're, we just saw was this idea of a system of insights and there's a lot more to it. There's a lot more um, capabilities beyond just insights, the application. It's really about being able to do this data analytics, whether it's exploratory or even you know in a data science world that might be in the form of you know scripting tools. So using a Python notebooks in order to um, access the same exact WebGIS data, but for a data scientist who works in a Python environment and wants to integrate open source Python libraries with this data, they can do that through Python notebooks that are also hosted as part of the WebGIS. Or maybe that's in their desktop tools and you know, geoprocessing and modeling tools, same thing, the same data, the same contents available um, through the GIS, um, in addition to that interactive analytics. So we can do that against big data um, systems, so we can connect to big data archives. We can do that against real time flowing in streaming data, and all of that's accessible through our enterprise. And so what we've been looking at um, throughout this um, whole presentation has been the ArcGIS Enterprise, which is what runs inside your, your environments um, for your intelligence systems on your intelligence networks, it has special purpose servers for GIS analysis, real-time analysis, um, imagery um, analysis, and all of the access to that has been through the portal. And we've built then these, these enterprise systems that are secure, so they're capable of integrating in with security systems, whether those are PKI systems or um, Active Directory systems that you can connect to um, in order to use your identity. So people log into the system, they have access to highly available services, um, and they can access data and content uh, for their enterprise and access these tools based on who they are and based on their ability to access tools and data. And this, this system's an open system, so it's not just about the applications that we showed you that are part of ArcGIS. This might, you might integrate other applications, whether it's Office or um, you might integrate with other backend systems like IBM Cognos or integrating it with your AutoCAD systems. And that system's open through various standards like OGC standards. And actually a lot of the applications we showed you are actually available as open source code. So if you're a developer, you can go to Esri's GitHub site and access the application source code and even make your own applications um, as a developer by writing code. So really what we talked about was the idea of bringing together the system of record, which can be the foundational geoint. That, some of that might come in from Esri's provided Living Atlas data, or it might come in from Living Atlas data produced in your organization. Um, it then provides access to data for insights or analytics, as well as our system of engagement. And ultimately, it provides it out to our, our operators and users in our community. So all the data and analysis you're doing and the products you're making can be shared with everybody in your community. So with that, thank you very much um, for attending. Um, if you have any questions, please, like, like I mentioned, enter those into the question module um, and we'll go through those. There's additional resources. If you wanna stay engaged with us, join our Defense and Intelligence community on GeoNet where we're doing blogging and communication. You can ask questions there after this session's over or if you're watching the video. 
Um, if you want to learn more about ArcGIS Enterprise or, or Insights for ArcGIS, which is the main products we showed you today, um, you can follow those links there. Um, and we'll, we'll send out other additional information after this webinar. And with that, I guess we'll turn it over to any questions. Laura, do you have any questions that have come in? Perfect. Thank you, Ben. Yes, we do have a few questions here. I have one that says, can you export the cards and workbooks out from Insight and into other programs? Well, the good question. So the Insights, you can share the workbook itself um, with anybody to use in their own applications. They can embed it as a you know, HTML page inside their applications. Um, the sharing out the cards themselves, no, because really the cards are just part of the Insights application. They're they're embedded inside a page that you share. Um, and then those those models are really for execution inside Insights. Now the data, I just want to point this out, all that data that you're processing, all that analysis you're processing, that's all data that's available on the portal. So every application that can connect to these services, these open services I talked about, can connect to that same data. So like when when Craig created that additional data set, yeah, he can share that out with anybody else to use in their own applications. Okay, perfect. Uh, we have another one asking, is there a size limit for the imported files into the web map? Um, so actually, that's a good question. Um, what I just want to mention before, I'm actually going to turn to the Craig to answer the specific question of, um, on the size limit. There is a limit. But in general, if it's large data, what we say is that needs to be part of your system of record, which means you need to stand up a server, you connect your data to that server and publish services. There's not a limit to that, but I think what you're probably referring to is the data that a user can upload themselves. So Craig, do you know what the size limit is for user uploaded data? Yeah, it actually varies in um, in the location that you're uploading it uh, to, Ben. So um, uploading it to the My Content page, uh, that that's a singular uh, a, a one gigabyte limit, um, and loading up limit, uh, I believe. But it, as you pointed out, those are uh, just a couple of very small ways to get content into the portal. And if you have that larger content, you really want to look to stand up ArcGIS Enterprise and service enable that content. And then those limitations will, will go away. Yeah, so you can serve up data to the WebGIS of any size, um, but the data that you would let users upload, and that, there's a lot of practical reasons for that. Browsers have limits to how much data they can upload. Right. And, and also um, just, just bandwidth and network. You wouldn't want people clobbering your system by uploading gigantic files. So. Um, that, that relates to that. So anything big would be something you design into your enterprise system. Okay. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Sure. We have one here that says, um, do I need to install any software on analyst desktops to run the Python notebooks? Yeah, so I think it's a good question. We didn't get a chance to actually show you the notebooks, but I mentioned it that one of the things that a lot of analysts do is they work with um, a technology called Jupyter Notebooks, which is a way to access Python through a web browser and use Python through a web browser. So we have that technology, which is part of the GI, our, the Insights tools for ArcGIS, so you could script. Um, in that case, what you're doing is the server is actually hosting the Python libraries, and then, then users are accessing those through a browser, and they're running their analysis through that browser, and they can share their analysis in the form of these in the form of these notebooks. So that gives you the ability to give people pretty rich analytic tools without necessarily having enough stuff on their desktop. Now, if they're gonna do heavy duty spatial analysis and you know, what we call traditional geoprocessing, then they would still wanna use ArcGIS Pro and use the ArcPy libraries to do that. And I think with that, that's probably all the time we have for questions. Um, I did see some questions come in related to getting copies of the presentation. So you will get an email with a link to the video recording. And um, we can also put out a PDF of the presentation as well. Um, so you can have access to that. Along with the thing I'd like to point out, we actually have done a number of webinars already this year, and those are all available um, as well um, in terms of video recordings that you can go access if you've missed any of the other presentations where we've covered some of these similar topics um, for the user perspective. With that, um, thank you a lot for um, attending today and sticking with us through the full hour. Um, and with that, hopefully we'll see you again at our next webinar. Thanks.